everyone again. I'm Anne. I'm from Stand.Earth. Uh, we're so happy to have you here today. And um, you can see already Jane Klebb, founder and president of Bold Alliance, and Matt Krogh, our extreme oil campaign director at Stand.Earth. And um, we are hoping to soon be joined by Winona LaDuke. She is en route today and she's trying to find a spot to uh, get connected to our webinar and uh, she's going to text me when she's there. So she should be with us in a moment. We're so happy to have you all on the line with us today. And I'm going to just take a moment to give you just a little bit of background on our speakers and then we'll go ahead and start. Um, so Winona LaDuke, who we hope will be joining us in just a moment, she is looking for a place to connect with us today. She has been a tireless leader on issues related um, to climate change, indigenous rights, human rights, and clean water for nearly 40 years. She is executive director and co-founder of Honor the Earth, an organization dedicated to creating awareness and support for native environmental issues and to developing needed financial and political resources for the survival of sustainable native communities. Honor the Earth is active in the battles against the Dakota Access and Line 3 pipelines. Jane Klebb is the founder and president of the Bold Alliance, a network of community groups in Nebraska, Iowa, Louisiana, and Oklahoma that fight fossil fuel projects, protect landowners against eminent domain abuse, and work for clean energy solutions. Dubbed the Keystone Killer by Rolling Stone, Jane is an experienced grassroots organizer, manager, political strategist, and nonprofit entrepreneur. And Matt Krogh is the Extreme Oil Campaign Director at Stand Out Earth. For the better part of the past 10 years, he's been a leader in the fights against coal and oil train terminals on the West Coast. He is the creator of the BlastZone.org website, where users can track the movement of dangerous oil trains. His professional training includes remote sensing, environmental education, and ecological modeling. And thank you so much, speakers, for being here today. And thank you so much um, to our audience for being here today. And with that, um, I think we thought we might start with Matt. Does that sound okay? And then and then go to Jane. Is that all right? And then um, and we'll get Winona in here um, as we can. And Matt, I'm going to pull up your PowerPoint. Awesome. Okay. And Matt, you'll let me know when to when to advance, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Awesome, thanks. Um, fair warning to everybody on the call. Uh, there are a couple of dogs in the office right now, and there is a chance <laughs> I'm going to see a barking frenzy any moment. Uh, hopefully, we'll try to try to prevent that happening. Um, so my name is Matt Krogh. I'm the director of our extreme oil campaign here at Stan. And let me first say how excited I am to, to be on this panel with both Winona and Jane and really looking forward to what you guys have, what you all have to say. Um, here at STAND, our, our mission really is to challenge both corporations and governments to treat people in the environment with respect because our lives depend on it. And uh, what that has meant in the oil world is on the north side of the border in Canada, we've ended up fighting tar sands pipelines. We've uh, partnered with First Nations to uh, stop the construction of the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline, which would have gone to BC's Central Coast. Um, and now we're working hard to stop the Kinder Morgan Pipeline, which would bring tar sands from Alberta to Vancouver. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that a little bit later. On the south side of the border, though, we're really focused on pretty much stopping all fossil fuel infrastructure, but with a, with an, uh, a real focus on oil trains. And I'm going to talk a bit today, and, and as part of this construct here, right, is why there's a really false choice between uh, pipelines and oil trains. Um, can you get the next slide, please? Anne, are you still there? I am still here. Awesome, thank you. Um, one of the things we want to talk about, too, is the sort of narrative that sometimes puts us in a place where we're uncomfortable working to stop uh, uh, the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure because people use words like hypocrisy. I myself drove to work today, and we're looking at a picture right now of Seattle's famous kayaktivists who drove their cars with their plastic kayaks to stop the polar explorer from going to the Arctic to drill in a very dangerous place. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, um, but can we get the next slide as well? But realistically, one of the things is we're kind of tired of industry and its defenders offering us a false choice. And we're going to really focus on that false choice because we're not talking about a need to choose between exploding oil trains that you see on the left there 
they give us a choice between that or pipeline spills like we see it in Mayflower, Arkansas on the right. That's a false choice. I'm going to talk about why. Next slide, please. So just to give a, a quick summary of where I'm going right now, the first thing I want to talk about is that we have a moral and scientific choice to work for these changes. We're going to talk about participating versus perpetrating the fossil fuel economy. And if you're on the call, you probably care about capping the growth of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, you may also be worried about what that means for us if we do cap the growth of the fossil fuel industry. We'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about false choices and equivalencies. Um, at a very high level, oil, the oil industry and society, we, we tend to believe in this artificial construct that we must see oil grow, that oil has to get to market. I want to challenge that assumption, uh, talk about the, the fact we don't need this extreme oil, and then as we sort of dive into the issue of the oil trains versus pipelines, I want to talk about two key points. One is that both are dangerous, and the other is that they're not interchangeable. The third key point here, we're at a turning point right now. We're moving towards clean energy. I'm going to talk some about what that means for jobs, what that means sort of in the international environment. Um, that's inevitable. And one of the things that the oil industry and the fossil fuel industry writ large relies on is our belief that the expansion of the fossil fuel industry is what's inevitable, and that's just not true. Then finally, I want to talk about effective resistance, which in my opinion, as we move forward in the age of Trump, effective resistance is local, it's intersectional, and it's networked. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> If I'm talking too fast, and you let me know. I'll, I'll try, to, try to stay within my 15-minute time limit, but uh, that sometimes it means a lot of words. Um, so first, let's talk about participating versus perpetrating. You know, there is a lot of talk in the press, and in the, particularly the comment sections, which I know we all like to read in various articles, about the hypocrisy of protesters burning fossil fuels or even using them. But here's the thing. There's a big difference between participating, which is what those protesters are doing as the, the Kai activists, and perpetrating, which is what we see BP doing when they cut corners on safety, when they put human lives in danger, and, and in fact we had deaths in the Deepwater Horizon disaster, when they put entire ecosystems at risk. That is perpetrating. And so right now, our obligation, I would suggest, is to work within our system. We, we're going to have to participate but we don't have to perpetrate the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure, whether it's pipelines or rail, barges, tankers. And it's a moral, it's also a scientific choice. Um, our current understanding of climate and climate change means that we need to keep 85% of existing proven reserves in the ground to meet a 1.5 degree cap on global warming. To meet 2 degrees, that's about 68%. Uh, those numbers come from a fantastic report that's called The Sky's the Limit. Uh, prepared by Oil Change International, a fantastic nonprofit out of DC. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the summary of that report, forgetting the numbers, which we'll share with you, is that the Paris Accords on Climate, ratified in, in New York and by the United Nations, mean that now is the time to begin a managed decline of fossil fuels, not, not to expand fossil fuel use, not to build new pipelines or new oil train facilities, but to start thinking about the managed decline. Um, one thing I want to mention, too, I just mentioned the, the Oil Change International Report. Um, any report or link that I mentioned in here, all of these images, we'll make sure are available to you if you want to use them. Um, we have a number of blogs coming out over the next couple of months, which will explore in depth some more of these ideas, so we'll make sure to share those as well. So let's go to uh, the next slide, please. So as we participate in this fossil fuel economy, one thing, too, I want to make sure that we all forgive ourselves for it, and recommit to changing it and not perpetrating it. So let's talk about false choices. Um, <laughs> you know, at, at a very large level, it's repeated over and over again, and I find myself getting caught in this trap. Uh, other people fall into this trap as well. Oil companies want you to believe that they have to expand, that oil has to get to market. And there's this hidden assumption that oil growth will happen, maybe forever even though it's a limited resource, you know, even though digging it up and burning it leads to catastrophe. But if there's no growth happening, there's no need for expanded infrastructure. I personally have had no trouble going to the gas station. The world is frankly awash in oil right now. We're seeing reduced per capita consumption in the U.S. and Canada. So one of the questions you have to ask is, 
if we're not expanding, do we need oil trains and pipelines? The answer is no. If they're trying to expand something that we don't need, who's it for? I think largely what we're seeing when we look at oil trains or pipelines is an intent towards exporting, whether it is the unrefined material or what we've been seeing lately, which is more and more refined petroleum products exported from the United States. Um, this infra infrastructure expansion is simply not for us. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and actually, you know, I, I, uh, I have to briefly uh, diverge into this one image that's been stuck in my head just to share it with you, and I don't have it drawn. I'll try to get it drawn. But I was, I've been thinking about this dynamic of trying to resist, um, you know, the pipeline companies, the train companies saying, which are you going to pick? And for me, it feels like we're, we're in this pot, a very large pot. On top of a stove, there's a couple burners on underneath this pot, and we're in there, and it's getting hotter and hotter. And we're being given the choice, which burner do you want to turn up? Do you want to turn up the one that's being fed by oil trains or by pipelines? We're like, no, stop it. No more heat. We don't, we don't want it boiling anymore. You know, this is, this is a false choice. It's not something that we really need. So let's get into the comparison between oil trains and pipelines. We've gotten past the question, do we need them? Is there a false construct? Yeah, please, next slide. Um, but they're both dangerous. I, I don't have an equivalent map to this one for pipelines. It's hard to get that data. Uh, what this map shows you, though, is the network of oil trains and where they travel around the United States. Um, the, the buffer section to the right there, it's about a one-mile buffer on each side, an area that we know is of concern if an oil train derails. When we look at who's within that one-mile buffer, we find 25 million Americans. We find 6 million Canadians, and in the U.S. at least, our analysis shows about 60% of those folks live in communities that could be uh, qualified as environmental justice communities. There are inequities associated with running dangerous oil trains through the towns and, and cities of America. Um, but both pipelines and rail have abysmal records of leaks and spills. In Kalamazoo, we saw nearly a million gallons of tar sands crude spilled. The, the, the impacts have lasted for years from that pipeline disaster. In Lac Megantic, we saw 47 people killed when one uh, rail, I'm sorry, one oil train derailed. We have a shocking regulatory failure. There's very little oversight of pipelines. There's very little oversight of oil trains. And what we saw in Lac Megantic was simply a, a company doing what it wanted to do, directing engineers to do the wrong thing and leaving a community at risk. And we saw what happened. Um, specific to oil trains, even the National Transportation Safety Board, the former chair, Jim Hall, I'm going to read a quick quote from last year. Uh, you know, the, the quote is, carrying crude oil by rail, it's just not a good idea. It can't be done safely, and period. So we're being asked to compare these things. They're both dangerous. Uh, we can also talk about barges. We can talk about tankers. Which of them you think is worse? And it's, it's I think it's a, a not a foolish argument to have, but it's, a difficult question because which one is worse depends on which impacts you're looking at. Are you looking at impacts to waterways? Are you looking at risks to human health? Are you looking at risks to motorists in the case of trucks? Uh, we'll share with you a Forbes article which goes into the comparison between all these. It comes out, they're all bad. Um, can we get the new slide, please? Next slide. So the other thing, and I apologize for this one being blurry, it, uh, it's an industry slide that we were able to use, and we only have the, the version that's a little expanded here. Um, when they ask me to choose between pipelines and rail, they're pretending that they're interchangeable. They're not. Shipping by rail is substantially more expensive per barrel than uh, pipelines. We know that pipelines also only connect a few points, whereas rail, I just showed you that map of the rail system in the U.S. for oil trains, it's diverse. It goes to a lot of different markets. So when they say that, they're being disingenuous. They aren't interchangeable, and they're serving different markets. There are different costs as well. Uh, comparison here, if you look at the Northwest, it costs three or four bucks to bring a barrel of oil by pipeline to Vancouver or Washington State. It costs double or triple that to bring it by rail. Um, when we talk about drilling down into certain regional geographies, one example here is in British Columbia, uh, people are being asked to accept the Kinder Morgan pipeline, 595,000 barrels a day, and they're being told if they don't accept it, they're going to get oil trains, lots of oil trains. This is disingenuous as well. Where are those oil trains going to go? We know that today there's only about 30,000 more barrels of free capacity for oil trains in Washington, even less in Oregon. 
California, uh, our allies and the movement is actively shutting down new terminals there. In fact, the movement has delayed or killed 20 out of 25 oil train proposals in the last three years. Where are these oil trains going to go? They're not. So when we stop infrastructure, we are stopping the expansion of the oil industry and the fossil fuel industry more broadly. Um, the final point uh, on this slide before we go to the next one, building new infrastructure, whether it's a pipeline or an oil train offloading facility, it's an investment that's intended to last decades. But we've seen that right now is the time to turn towards clean energy. Right now we're actually at this, this pivotal point where we need to cap the growth and move towards a managed decline. Can, next slide, please. There we go. Um, this picture is of a new solar facility being installed uh, in Alberta's uh, Lubicon Bands territory. Uh, the picture came from Melina Lubicon Massimo, who is another amazing uh, indigenous woman leading the way, like Monona. Um, they've had two separate nearby oil spills, tens of thousands of gallons from pipeline breaks in the last couple of years. And here we're seeing people are saying, enough is enough. We're going to move past it. Another thing that we have are utilities. In the U.S., it's being reported in mainstream media. It's not the edgy media anymore. You know, we're seeing the average lifetime cost of solar and wind unsubsidized beating fossil fuels for new infrastructure. Um, there's a quote from uh, an article referring to Lazard, they're a financial consulting firm, that the transition away from coal burning power plants now seems unstoppable, even if Trump scraps requiring utilities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The average lifetime cost for utility scale wind and solar generation in the US is now cheaper than coal or nuclear and comparable to natural gas. That's a big change, and that's important when utilities are moving in the same direction we are. Um, jobs. A lot of people talk about jobs in, this, in these arguments. Uh, the jobs in renewables are amazing, and they're growing today. Uh, according to Clean Energy Canada, as of 2015, there were 26,900 Canadians working in clean energy, meaning that for the first time, there are more people working in clean energy than in the tar sands. Uh, in electric power generation in the U.S., there are more jobs in solar and wind than in natural gas, coal, and oil combined. This is an amazing thing. Um, but even as we recognize that, as we move into thinking about who we're going to work with towards this transition, we have to recognize that there are negative impacts. Um, this turning point impacts real people. And if we look more closely regionally, we find that we've got to work together with frontline communities, with labor unions, with refineries, and on the railroads, uh, local policymakers, anything we can do to facilitate a transition that is also just. Um, one of the issues here is society isn't just struggling with questions about energy supply and climate change. We're also struggling with the fundamental, I think, inequities of communities that are impacted by refineries, by climate change, um, people whose jobs are at stake in a changing economy. Um, and when we see centralized power in the fossil fuel industry, that perpetuates those inequities. So we have to work with all the impacted parties to envision a future that actually frees us, I think, from a false expectation of fossil fuel growth. And it's that fossil fuel growth expectation that creates, again, this false construct between oil trains and pipelines. Um, next slide, please, and we'll get to the, my final point. So successful resistance. We've had a lot of successes in movement stopping this infrastructure. We're going to hear from Jane, we're going to hear from Winona. Um, but I think as we go forward in this sort of, I don't want to call it the Trump era, uh, that perhaps aggrandizes it too much, but I think successful resistance is going to be local, it's going to be intersectional, it's going to be networked. Um, we're going to have to assume when we fight these projects that federal agencies are going to be directed to be hostile. But then federal agencies, they don't trump local land use authority. They don't trump the Constitution and, and the law that protects treaty rights. Uh, here in Northwest Washington, we've had the Lummi Indian Nation successfully fight off North America's largest coal terminal by asserting their treaty rights and fishing rights. In Benicia, California, they fought off Valero's uh, proposed oil train terminal by rejecting permits, which they were told they couldn't do. And we see proactive steps, too. In Portland, Oregon, they passed legislation to zone out new oil infrastructure, new fossil fuel infrastructure. Over the next four to six weeks, where I live here in Whatcom County, Washington, up in the northwest corner of the U.S., uh, we expect to pass legislation that will prevent the permitting of any new unrefined fossil fuel export facilities. Uh, we're right at the center of the storm here. 
We have pipelines, we have rail coming here, and we don't want it. So all of us on this call, uh, we each have the opportunity to work locally and pushing towards a clean energy future and also trying to halt the expansion of the fossil fuel industry. Um, one of the things that's really a feature here too is when we work locally, we have the opportunity to protect and insist on integrity in our government processes and our representation. It's a lot harder to do that at the national level. Can we get the next slide, please? And so uh, this slide, this is part of the Break Free uh, March in Skagit County in Washington State in May. Uh, indigenous leaders, local leaders, all kinds of folks are coming together to push for a just transition, to push away from the proposed oil train facility that was there. Um, and if we're going to succeed nationally, it's going to take all of us. Uh, we need to build allied groups, whether it's with labor or tribal groups or nonprofits, government leaders, scientists, business. Um, we need to get past some of the issues we're having here where rail, for example, should be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Oil trains are a problem and coal trains are a problem, but rail is the greatest way to move goods and we need to respect that. And when we drill down to local concerns and needs, refinery workers and unions, um, they see the writing on the wall. It's a, it's a scary future. We need to work together to make sure that this transition that we've framed, that we envision, it's just and that we're all working together on it and, and resisting this uh, fossil fuel effort at expansion. Um, one place I invite you all to join, we have something here at STAN called the Crude Awakening Network. It's a group that's primarily focused on oil trains right now, but we have monthly calls, we have conversations about best practices, how to uh, work locally, how to resist fossil fuel expansion, um, how to push towards clean energy. So we'll, we'll circulate a way to sign up after that. We have monthly calls, we have listserv, we have some other tools. Um, so we get, next slide please. So just to sum up again, um, this is a moral, it's a scientific choice to resist fossil fuel infrastructure expansion. Um, the only reason that we feel like we have these false choices and equivalencies between things like pipelines and oil trains is because that's being pushed on us, being pushed on us intentionally, and society broadly accepts it. We need to move beyond that and recognize that we're moving towards clean energy. What we saw happen in Paris, what we see happening at national levels, what we see happening in the cost of clean energy and jobs, that's the direction we're going. But in the meantime, we need to make sure that we have effective resistance. We need to work locally. We need to be intersectional and network together. And when we do that, we're going to win. So that's what I got. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, give me one moment, everybody. Um, I uh, and we will and Jane be patient with me for one moment here. Um, sure. I think Winona is going to be able to connect to us, and I need to send her something to help do that. <laughs> so sit tight for just a moment. No problem. Okay. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and um, Jane, I've got uh, just a couple pics from your website um, that sure. I might might show as Look you see. That's great. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, let me just get those lined up, and I'll just try to move around to the you know kind of right place at the right time. And um, and okay. All right, I'm just going to start showing that a little bit. Okay, and thanks cool. again for your patience and, and um, start whenever you're ready. Okay, so thank you, Anne, for doing all the logistics and planning of this. Obviously, Matt and I could not have done it without you, so deeply appreciate that. And I always love listening to Matt. He's one of the best that we have um, at the national and at the state and local level. Uh, one of the few national campaigners that deeply cares about what's happening at the state and local level. Um, so always excited to be with Matt. And thanks to everybody who gets who's getting on this afternoon. I know that we are being pulled in lots of directions. I think it is a scary time for a lot of us. Um, you know, for farmers and ranchers here in Nebraska, they are now terrified that a pipeline could be shoved 
through their farm and ranch and land that's been in their hands for generations. Um, you know, our immigrant brothers and sisters in Nebraska, where I live, we actually have the highest amount of refugees that we've welcomed in our state on a per capita basis, um, mostly because of ag jobs in our state. And they're terrified that at any moment Donald Trump is going to expand, you know, his travel ban and what he's doing, especially to Muslim individuals. And all across, you know, our country, whether it's black, Latino, Native Americans, um, moms who are terrified about public education now, we have a dangerous and reckless president who does not care about climate change and, in fact, believes that it is a hoax and believes that taking people's land through eminent domain for private projects is perfectly acceptable. In fact, he says that he loves it. So we have a huge challenge in front of us. But the good thing is we have hundreds of people on this webinar today. We had millions in the streets the day after the inauguration. We've had thousands coming to trainings and rallies and really making their voices heard. Or last night, uh, as Mitch McConnell tried to silence Elizabeth Warren, um, he gave us a new rallying call. Um, you know, he said that she was warned, but she persisted. And that's exactly what we all are doing, is we are persistent, we are resolute, and we are a movement that will resist all of these actions from Trump. So I'm specifically going to talk a little bit about Keystone XL, what we did to stop it the first time. Um, with all of our national and state and native allies and how we think we can do that again. And I think TransCanada and the Wall Street Journal is saying, you know, third time's the charm. This will be the third time that they've applied for the Keystone XL permit. And we're essentially saying three strikes and you're out. Like we've beat you twice before and we're ready to beat you for the third time. One of the things that was critical in the Keystone fight, and we've seen this with Standing Rock and we've seen this with oil trains, is that we at the local level can't fight alone. That we need our allies across kind of, you know, race and ethnicity and kind of normal silos of kind of progressive organizing. But we also need to connect with our national allies. You know, we could have never had the experts that came in and testified at hearings or the water analysis that we needed in order to make the case of why we were so concerned about a tar sands pipeline through the Ogallala Aquifer without our national allies. And so we see that happening now with Standing Rock and we see it moving forward with all of these fights, that the big national groups, the Sierra Clubs, the 350s, have to work hand in hand with our kind of smaller groups like Stand and Bold and Oil Change and then the really grassroots groups, the groups that are started by moms and young people and our native allies at the grassroots level that essentially use their own money to make rally signs and everything else. So we all work hand in hand and share resources, which is the critical piece. And that's how, you know, that's one aspect of the fight and how we be Keystone. The other aspect is we organized landowners and for us, that was a key part because we see how these big oil corporations play. They get around regulations that sometimes are on the books because they line, literally, line elected officials' pockets with money and with campaign donations. And so the one thing that we felt here in Nebraska that we had control over was the land. And landowners are doing this in Minnesota, in Wisconsin, in Virginia, and in West Virginia, in Florida, and in Georgia. All over the country, landowners are standing up and using the same tactic. They're essentially coming together, forming an alliance together, because we are all stronger, just like unions have taught us. We're all stronger together. And essentially telling the pipeline companies, no, we're not signing. Number one, we don't think it's legal for you to use eminent domain for a private project. And number two, this is not going to be good. It's not going to be good for climate. It's not going to be good for land. It's not going to be good for our water. That meant really joining hands with a strong legal team that could represent the landowners in court. Um, but it also meant us being in the streets to really build up the public support for those landowners. So when they went into the courtroom, the judges and the people on the jury knew that the public was standing with the landowners, not standing with big oil. So even if you're not a landowner, even close to a pipeline route, you have a critical role in building up the public support to stop these pipelines. And the other thing that we did is we picked a target. You know, for us, that was President Obama. In the beginning of the Keystone fight, nobody thought we would win. Nobody thought we'd be able to convince Secretary Clinton 
for President Obama to stand with us to reject the pipeline. Everybody thought, as every other cross-border pipeline went, that Keystone would eventually get permitted. But we were persistent, and we made it very personal because the reality is that all of these fights do involve politics. Even if you hate politics, you have to come to the realization that these fights involve politics. So we made it very personal for President Obama, and we're gonna make it very personal for President Trump. We did lots of handwritten letters. We sent pens that said, you know, this machine stops pipelines, you know, because we were encouraging President Obama to sign the executive order no. Um, we sent pictures of landowners and our native allies with handwriting on the back. You know, any, we never know what's going to be kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back. Letters to the editor, handwritten letters, phone calls, tweets, Facebook messages, all of that grassroots outreach is critical and it's good that it's often not very expensive for us at the grassroots level to do. So we built alliances with national groups. We got very local, hyper-local, and figured out the local strategy that we thought we could use to stop the pipeline, and we created a top-level political target. And I'm sure people are wondering now, can we stop Keystone XL now that we don't have a president who is with us? So the good thing is that there is multiple permits that a border of the, a pipeline of this size has to get. So I do think that President Trump will approve the cross-border permit. He has said as much. He's already fast-tracked to code access easement. They haven't even done the full environmental review of the river crossing there. So that's all moving forward. We have no doubt in our mind that he will approve TransCanada's cross-border permit. But in Nebraska, they still have to go through our state process. They still have to go through what's called the Public Service Commission. It's a year-long process where citizens and experts get to testify on why we think this pipeline should not be permitted. We can argue if the PSC is going to give them a permit that TransCanada should be forced to twin Keystone 1 with Keystone XL. Not the ideal scenario, but if this pipeline's getting shipped through our state, we don't want any more things out of production. And the other thing is, is we're going to continue to fight TransCanada and the courts on imminent domain. Uh, we continue to think that we have a very strong um, fight in a very strong case, and landowners in Georgia and Ohio in this past year have won, where they have gone to the courts and said, listen, this is a for-profit pipeline. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that a private corporation can take land. Uh, eminent domain was created so we could build roads and schools and waterways, um, never for oil pipelines, especially not export pipelines, pipelines that don't even benefit the United States. So we're going to really fight at that level as well. And I'll say I'm excited to take Keystone on XL, a Keystone XL on again, because what happened up at Standing Rock with all of the nations coming together just proves that people power, when we all come together, can win. And while the president has approved that river crossing, he's ignited an entire movement and awareness of people um, that just did not think twice about oil trains or pipelines before. So I'm going to pass it over to Anne, but I, again, want to thank everybody and look forward to questions coming up. Oh, and there's Winona. Hi, Winona. <laughs> Great. Winona, there may be a little background noise where you are, but it looks like it's settled down for the moment. I'm, I'm kind of doing the best I can. Hello, Jane. Hello, Matt. Hello, everybody. <laughs> You're doing awesome as usual. Wonderful. I, I was way up north, and I'm in a little coffee shop in a town right on the proposed pipeline route. I, I thought <laughs> I'd share the webcam with the, with the community here. Right on, right on. When on it, should we start um, by trying to show a little bit of that uh, video? Should we start there, or do you want to speak a little bit first? Um, you know, sure, if you want to show a little bit of the video, that's fine. I'll, I'll drink a little tea if you want to do that, and then, uh, um, you know, and then visit about where, where we're at up here in northern Minnesota. Okay, great. And presenters, give me a shout if for some reason it, the uh, video isn't showing. Okay, give me just a sec to set it up. Expand it here. There's a beauty in the breath of people. Fall morning's breath seen in the air, the smell and sound of horses. 
We rode our horses from the headwaters of the Mississippi River here on our reservation. It was a third of a series of rides on pipelines. We're not protesters or protectors. That's who. This we call the Triple Crown of Pipeline Rides. This rides to the Alberta Clipper proposed expansion route to the proposed Keystone XL route in the Dakotas. We're a rider from the White Earth Reservation, one from the Dakota to ride between the Bikini and the Shining River. So it was that 15 riders braved some harrowing terrain, a land littered with 100,000 dead cattle from a freak September blizzard, and rode the proposed Keystone Road. And then we came home to our own reservation, where a new pipeline is proposed to cut near our largest broad rice lake. That pipeline will carry fracked oil from the Dakotas. Much of this comes from the homelands of the Yurikara, Mandan, and Hidatsa people, also known as the Fort Berthold Reservation, which is under assault by oil companies, and where water and people are challenged not only by a pipeline, but also by a proposed refinery. Okay, just wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of that. Can you that. Turn on the audio on the back one? So, um, and I'll send everybody the link so you can watch the rest of that. Um, when we've got the video posted from today, I'll send you the link so you can watch the rest of that. But we wanted to let you see um, a bit of that. And um, so with that, I'm going to clear off the screen here. See if they can turn down the music. Oh, great. Hi. Okay, great. And... Uh, I'm going to just move another another uh, slide up here. All right. Winona, thank you. Thanks for your patience during that setup and um, whenever you're ready. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I, I hope you all can hear me okay. I'm good. Thank you. And just keep the audio down for me if you would in the background. Thank you. Um, so I'm up here in northern Minnesota. I live on the White Earth Reservation, and I just came from a gathering of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. We, um, you know, without going into a lot of detail, we've had six pipelines crossing our land for quite a while. Of course, you know, none of us really knew about um, or paid a lot of attention to them. I mean, I basically, you know, it, they've been there for a long time. They're put in there before the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, all laws that we are treasuring. Um, and uh, we're running across our territory. So we've got about 100 miles of liability of 50-year-old pipelines that are up here in the North Country right now um, on, on what's kind of the Highway 2 territory, uh, Leech Lake Reservation, Fond du Lac Reservation, old pipes. And this country is full of a lot of old pipes right now. We have a DN infrastructure in the country, and you've got a lot of really, really old pipes. These are some of the worst. This is the things that go across the Straits of Mackinac, uh, the same pipes that go across there and, and um, you know, a lot of danger in these pipes right now. And so what Enbridge is proposing is, is two things. One is, is that um, until um, last year, they were proposing this pipeline called the Sandpiper, which was going to be a fracked oil pipeline uh, crossing our territory. And that pipeline would have come from North Dakota, uh, 640,000 barrels a day of oil, fracked oil coming. We launched about a four-year battle. Um, against that pipeline. All our communities working with non-Indian people. We didn't have a lot of national groups interested in it because it was a fracked oil pipeline. I've never really understood kind of the difference in distinguishing of national groups between like it's a fracked oil pipeline, it's not as much as a tar sands pipeline, the carbon impact or whatever. I never quite got that. For us it was all the same because it was bad for the environment, bad for our mother earth, and really bad for our water. Uh, we're wild rice people, you know, and uh, 
this reservation here that I'm on right now, Leech Lake, is 50% water. And so you can imagine how much uh, problem that's going to be if uh, you got a pipe leak. And we've already had some big pipe leaks up here. So we had a four-year battle against the sandpiper. Um, we rode our horses. That video is about our horse ride a little bit. We rode our horses for four years against the current of the oil. I never did get Jane to ride with me, but she has some fancy cowboy boots. So one day we'll get them dancing <laughs> cowboy boots out there on one of my horses, and, and we'll ride uh, together. And, and Matt, I don't really know you, but I'm sure you have fancy cowboy boots, and you should please join us as well um, on, on the ride. Um, but Anyway, we dream that we should, I dream we should ride against that current of the oil, and so we uh, fought them in pretty much every process. Similar to Jay, we learned a lot from Jane's battle. A little bit different situation here because here uh, you have a lot of tribal land in the north. The demographics are a little bit more like North and South Dakota in our territory. There's a lot of reservations close together, and um, you know a lot more federal jurisdiction issues. We organized. Um, worked through the public utilities process, super flawed process here um, in Minnesota. And Minnesota, in comparison to like North Dakota, looks like an, a very enlightened state. But the fact that regulatory capture that existed here was, you know, pretty significant. Um, there was a lot of pitching this whole idea that, you know, we wouldn't have more um, oil trains. You know, we used to see the bomb trains going across the same corridor here, the Highway 2 corridor, with some consistency. And as you drove from you know, my house, my reservation down towards the cities, you would constantly see the bomb trains going by, about 10 bomb trains a day uh, going by these small towns, really concerning a lot of people. We did have uh, one small train blow up in Castleton, North Dakota, which really alerted a lot of the politicians, and they used that as a reason to say that they should have more pipelines because they had a bomb train blow up. Um, we uh, continued that battle. And, uh, you know, try to convince people that, you know, which I think I'm sure that Matt and the rest of you have discussed that, you know, that you, you don't get to trade one or the other, you know, uh, a pipeline or a bomb train, you know, because they go to different destinations, it's a different system, and, uh, you know, kind of my position is, is like, do you want your heroin to come in by train or by pipeline? That's what I'm thinking, you know, and that's what we need to be, you know, that's what we're talking about, is it's like heroin. You know, why are we trying to justify the system for bringing it into this country? You know, we need to talk about, you know, uh, stopping it coming in. And, um, you know, particularly here, because we're up on the border. We're up on the, on, the, on the Canadian border. So in the process of replumbing North America to fit the needs of the Koch brothers and now Exxon, because, as we know, most of the oil was not coming from here in, uh, in the Northland at all, but was coming from Venezuela for many years and from, in southern ports. Um, you know, we, we continued a very, very tough battle. And, um, you know, our communities worked really, really hard. Our tribal governments worked hard. We all kind of, um, you know, bad deals had been signed in the past, and a lot of agreements had been made that they didn't really know about. Uh, but what the company wanted to do is to throw a whole new route down. And so we fought that route. And uh, we did have uh, success in August of this last year. They announced that they had canceled this pipeline uh, called the Sandpiper, the, the 640,000 barrel a day Sandpiper line. And then they announced the company Enbridge, um, the largest pipeline company in North America, announced that it was going to instead purchase 28% of the Dakota Access Pipeline. And, uh, you know, so uh, we, we followed them out there, is what we did. Because we didn't think that if it was right for us, it was not. It was not right for us, it was also not right for them. And so on the Earth, our organization, a lot of our Anishinaabe people, I mean, my reservation is four hours from Standing Rock. And um, our people all, you know, traveled out there. I have a lot of family members. We camped out there. I, you know, I've, I've had family members that have been uh, arrested, uh, hit with bullets, uh, beaten up by Morton County, arrested, board members. Uh, you know, we've been out there, on, uh, you know, in, the, in this battle. And, um, you know, in that... Um, you know, it's very, uh, very hard for us to see, you know, what is going on out there. And that, but the unity that has been, you know, brought forth by that battle, I, I agree with Jane. I did listen to, you know, some of your comments, Jane. Like, it's this moment, for us, it was like a Selma moment. It's a Selma moment. Um, you know, what happened in, 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 at Standing Rock and what is happening in Standing Rock. It's as if this moment is, is like, you know, because for the for the issues that are in our territories, 
you know, I, I'm really not familiar with, you know, what has already been said here, but, you know, the fact is, is that where we live, or particularly North Dakota and South Dakota, they're the deep north. That's what we refer to them as, is the deep north. And, um, you know, everybody's been flying over North Dakota for years and saying, hey, there's North Dakota. Or, you know, I saw that movie Fargo. That was a funny movie. You know, I've never been in North Dakota. That's funny state, huh? You know, what happened is it got totally depopulated. Um, you know, Nebraska didn't get quite the same hit as North Dakota, but they lost more and more and more, more people. And what was left there was like a lot of older, you know, German, Norwegian, Lutherans, pretty much. Scandinavian and German people, you know, a lot of older people felt kind of abandoned. And they pretty much have a state that has been run over by oil companies, uh, run over by oil companies. And also they have fed on the racism in the north. And uh, they have fed racism. I mean, you have white extremists in the north. You have neo-Nazis trying to purchase towns in North Dakota. And uh, nobody noticed any of that. Nobody noticed any of that. And so, uh, you know, there's been a lot of Indian hating in the north all these years, and nobody's been noticing it because it's North Dakota. And uh, when Standing Rock happened, you know, people started to notice what racism looks like when it's unrolled with a bunch of new money from Homeland Security, you know, $12 million worth of militarization that unrolls on people. I mean, what the hell do you need an MRAP for? A set piece of equipment you're looking at in that video, in that slide. What is an MRAP? A mine-resistant armored personnel carrier. There is no reason, there are no land mines in North Dakota. There's a bunch of missile silos, and I'm not sure how we're going to work out with the fracking earthquakes, you know, frankly. But, um, you know, so this battle has been very hard, been very enlightening uh, for a lot of our people up here and, uh, you know, continues on in North Dakota. And it's not pretty out there right now. It's not pretty. It's the time of the Windigo. That's what I call it up here, the time of the Windigo. The cannibals come. It's very bad out there, you know. So, you know, where I'm coming from right now, you know, my, uh, you know, I don't know where the oil's all going to come from for the Dakota Access Pipeline in part. Um, I don't know. I don't know where that's all going to come from. Um, can you hold on one second, girls? Girls. Oh my God! I just had to do that. I'm so sorry, you guys. You're a mom. I love it. <laughs> um. um so, um, you know, um, the 760,000 barrels per day of, of oil that they want to put in the Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, I, I'm looking at the math on this whole thing, and, and what I don't really understand is that there's um, 900,000 barrels a day of oil coming out of the Bakken right now. And in 2019, two years from now, 2019, they're projecting that there'll be 900,000 barrels a day of oil coming out of the Bakken. So I don't know where the 570,000 barrels a day of oil is coming from because I already have 900,000 barrels a day of oil coming out of the Bakken. I don't know where the 570,000 barrels a day that's going to fit that energy transfer pipeline is coming from. That's what we call the Dakota Excess Pipeline. It, like Trump, is full of spite, hatred, and, you know, a lot of racism. So... Um, you know, as things unfold there, and they and the Trump administration announces his glorious plans for stupid infrastructure that we don't need, um, you know, here, our tribes are preparing for the next round of this battle. You know, um, they announced the, uh, you know, we had expected the 760,000 barrel a day um, line three. They plan to go in the same route we just defeated them in, in the Sandpiper. And our tribes are now uh, preparing to do both a full um, comprehensive in, in, in our cumulative impact assessment, the equivalent of an EIS, to challenge the insufficient assessment of the, of, the, of the pipeline impacts that is being proposed by the state of Minnesota. And uh, we have noted that there are no oil trains going by us right now. Uh, that's because the Bakken itself has had an 85% drop in drilling rigs in the Bakken. And so there's no oil trains going by us right now. Uh, oil train traffic is down significantly. 
I'm really not sure, you know, how this is all going to work out in Trump's fantasies. And what I am sure is, is that, you know, resistance in our territory is very high. And, you know, our people here, many of our people took bullets out in North Dakota. Many of our people took bullets out in North Dakota. I just presented to all the tribal chairs, all the, all the tribal leaders in this region, and I, and I talked with all those tribal leaders, and I said, your people took bullets. They're ready to take bullets here. You need to stop that. You need to stop that, and you need to make sure that Enbridge knows that this is not North Dakota. You can't treat us like that, and you can't run, you know, you can't run over us like that because, and, and this is not, you know, 1890. This is not 1920 when you burned us out of our villages here in northern Minnesota. This is, you know, 2017, and we are very strong. So, you know, as things unroll here, you know, honor the earth. Um, you know, we are a little bit like Jane. We're, you know, we're a national organization, but we're very regionally focused. We're really grassroots. We are now in two separate battles, essentially. We're both in North Dakota, and we are we are in, entrenched in the Enbridge battles that span from Minnesota, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin. And uh, that's a pretty big terrain. We are looking for a lot of support from national organizations and what looks to be a very bloody, a very bloody future in this. Um, but you know, we are we are a pretty tough bunch. Um, you know, we are a very tough bunch. And um, you know, that's that's what we are made of. And we have survived this far. And we we intend to to continue this, you know, battle here. Oh, that's that's kind of the short of it. Okay. Great. Thank you, Winona. Thank you also, Jane and Matt. We have a ton of questions coming in. Usually we try to bring in people's voices, but um, just to help everything go a little more smoothly today, I'm just going to ask on everyone's behalf. Um, and we've got several, quest several people asking um, similar questions, so something really important to put to all three of you. Um, that people are often encountering um, elected leaders, politicians, who are perpetuating the myth that we need this oil, we need to bring this oil to market. Um, and, and then that's connected also to Trump saying recently he hasn't gotten any calls about Dakota Access, about, the, about his move on Dakota Access and his move on Keystone. And so I just wanted to uh, give you all a chance to talk about coming at politicians in general when they're perpetuating the myth and then and then this recent um, recent stuff from Trump in particular and uh, just uh, jump in any of you who'd like to start I mean I think it's important that everybody starts shaming Trump on Twitter since he loves to tweet and we know he reads things on Twitter um, so the more that we can kind of amplify you know, he actually closed down the White House comment line, so the White House is currently not taking comments like President Obama did. So you as a citizen could have called the White House at any moment and either talked to a life person or left a message for the president, um, and Trump has closed that line down. So if you call it, uh, it just says that they're not taking any comments at this time. So definitely tweeting or messaging them on Facebook, like commenting on any of their stories on Facebook is a good way for citizens to kind of get public out there. Um, but I also think just as important it is to shame politicians who aren't listening to us and showing up at town halls and all the kind of stuff that we know we need to do as citizens that are kind of described in the Indivisible Guide, for example. Um, we should also be lifting up um, politicians who are doing the right thing. So if you haven't heard of Tom Perriello, he is running for governor in the state of Virginia. He did a beautiful video. It's on his Facebook page and it's on his Twitter feed. Um, he did it this morning, where he describes why he is against two fracked gas pipelines that are threatening their land and water, and he specifically mentions climate change. Um, I've never seen a politician describe their opposition to a pipeline uh, as good as Tom Perriello. So also lift up the good guys, too. Great. Winona or Matt, do you want to jump in? Um, I, I would love to jump in, actually. I, th I think um, the Tom Periello example is amazing. I watched that uh, video this morning, and, and as Jane said, it's, a, it's an amazing example of leadership. I think one of the issues that we have is leadership is actually a rare quality. Um, and if we're going to expect to see our politicians lead, um, one of the things that we can do is help um, give them cover. 
Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a 45-minute testimony by a climate denier in the Washington State Senate yesterday, and uh, one of the uh, fantastic leaders that we've got, uh, Senator Ruben Carlisle, um, he uh, was savagely attacked after that testimony uh, because he, he dared to suggest that climate change is science that is relatively settled and that we need to be acting on it. Um, so he's being attacked for that. Um, one of the solutions uh, is something like what we call in the Northwest. There's a group that's organized out of King County, which is the county that Seattle is, resides in, called the Safe Energy Leadership Alliance. Um, that alliance now consists of over 200 um, elected officials from uh, municipalities, from the state, from tribes, um, all of whom are committed to safe energy. That entity, because it exists, has allowed, uh, has sort of created a, I don't want to call it a herd, but you know, we're all to a certain extent members of our, of our various herds, and politicians are too, um, and if they have some cover, if they have other people working with them, if they can band together, you know, I, I talked about you know our successful resistance. It's going to be it's going to be local. It's going to be intersectional. It's going to be networked. That's true for politicians too, and we need to to help them uh, create these entities. At this point, the Safe Energy Leadership Alliance is really Northwest focused for the Northwest U.S. Um, but there's no reason it can't be replicated or expanded or built and provide an opportunity for politicians to um, lead uh, and lead more strongly without. The, the fear that I'm certain many of them feel. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, I think what we all know is that now is the time to have courage. You know, there, this is, there's a, a political crisis that is immense. It is, you know, a national crisis and it is a growing international crisis. And it is the time for people who have, have been elected to find their courage. It is time to stand against a bully. You know, it is, and the bully is Trump, and the bully is Rex Tillerson, and the bully is the oil industry. It has been a long time in coming. We people have been standing up. We've been taking bullets on it, you know. And so what I want to see is, is that, you know, we just need to encourage them. I, I totally get the herd mentality. You know, so the more that we can hold up examples and, and tell people to find their inner metal. I mean, it is a test of all of us, you know, the situation that we find ourselves in now. Is it tests our inner, you know, our inner being, and it is it is the time for us to find our courage to hold up these examples and and to keep as as people being stronger and stronger. It is also really clearly a time to to look at the you know the the analysis on these issues. I mean, as I look out there, you know, I'm, I'm often reminded of I was reading an article in um, my Harvard magazine. They still send me my Harvard magazine along with my request to to donate to the Harvard Fund, although I graduated and I have them any money in 35 years. They have enough. But anyway, I was reading in my Harvard Magazine uh, a couple years ago this article on uh, Mara Mar Prentice, Mara Prentice. And Mara Prentice said, um, she's a professor of physics at Harvard, and what she said is, is that um, she was talking about the physics of energy. And you know, it never occurred to me, but a, a combustion engine in a vehicle, a combustion engine in my car is 16% efficient. It's 16% efficient. Now what kind of stupid world would continue with a 16% efficient engine when in fact an electric engine is 65% efficient you know so to me as the moves as the industry continues to move towards greater levels of efficiency increasing the number of electric vehicles i know that that is far above any intelligence in washington right now but that is what we have to keep talking about is the changes in the industry that are occurring on a worldwide scale and to keep pushing those and you know a lot of that to be super honest about it is is like People keep saying renewable energy can't meet present demand. I'm like, why would you want to meet present demand? Present demand is 57% of our power is wasted between point of origin and point of consumption. So why would you want to feed a system that it was so inefficient? What you would really want to do is get efficient and get far more local because we are transporting our food everywhere. Like, I really like those avocados and kiwis, and I'm going to have a hard time giving up my coconut milk. But for crying out loud, you know, everything is getting shipped around and the more that we relocalize the less oil we use and and in fact you know the, there is a decline in the use in Minnesota so don't drink the Kool-Aid is what I would say just quit drinking the Kool-Aid and and you know look at the facts and, and 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 keep articulating messages you know and and spell it out for your politicians so that they can find their courage or you know give them like a little courage boost 
little courage pep talks. We have several questions about uh, what people can do in the next few days, uh, next few weeks, um, to support the protectors um, against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Lots of concern for people's welfare, and uh, and I know there are lots of actions being organized. Just wondering what suggestions are for um, for people who are um, around the country and uh, and inside and outside the U.S. who are joining us today. Dan, you want to say something first? Um, so first, you know, actions on either the Standing Rock Nations website or 350.org. Those are two good places that you can go to see all the national actions that are happening. Uh, some are happening today. We have one in Omaha where we're delivering 14,000 petitions to the Army Corps there. Um, so that's all happening and led by the Winnebago Nation of Nebraska, um, which is why I'm not there because they're doing the good work of leading it. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is, is on March 10th, um, Standing Rock and all the allied nations have asked um, everybody to go to Washington, D.C. for a march to show President Trump that, in fact, uh, there are people out here that do not like the pipeline since he said that he hasn't received a single phone call against the pipeline. Um, so that's going to be a big day as well. And I can imagine lots of creative actions, which I won't get into here, uh, that I think are going to be planned for that day as well to show the creativity of the resistance. Well, I just like to say, you know, I'm I'm hoping that you know I know that the veterans are redeploying, you know, because I you know I'm very concerned. I I will be out there early next week. Um, you know, we have we have big meetings this weekend here on our battles, but um, you know I'm very concerned about the level of violence escalating out there, and so I'm hoping that there is. You know that the veterans are supported in their return out there because when the veterans came to Standing Rock, I think that that really turned it quite a bit because I think that North Dakota was ashamed to be, you know, to be injuring veterans. I think they're very ashamed at that. And uh, you know, I remember talking to one veteran and he said something I'm never going to forget. He said, um, I, "I I left blood in Afghanistan and you're telling me that I'm going to die on a bridge in North Dakota." You know, and that's what I feel like is is like. You know, let let us support those veterans to come out there to help de-escalate. You know, to to you know to be to be there in that process. You know, because I you know we are fully aware of what it looks like out there, and it it is brutal. You know, and then also remember the kind of the bigger picture. You know, we refer to this as the time of the Windigo. You know, in our territory, and you know this is very brutal. It's 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 minus one right now. That's not particularly brutal for Jane, but for a lot of people, you know, it's been much colder here right now. And so these people are out there. You know, a yurt is the way to go in case you're ever wondering for the winter camping, go yurt. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, it's tough. It's very tough out there. And, and there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of, there's a lot of fear that happens in the winter time when the windigo comes. I mean, the windigo is the, is, is the cannibal in our territory. It's a cannibal. You know, on the lake that I live on in my reservation, a man ate his children a hundred years ago. He ate his whole family, you know. And I'm saying that that happens, and that's what I'm seeing happening out there right now. There's a lot of internal dissension. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of preying upon that fear. There's a lot of, you know, things that are being said that will be regretted and actions that will be regretted. So it is this time that we are in. And even the tribe, you know, the Standing Rock tribe, I have great relations and great respect for, for, for Dave Arshambo. At the same time, it is a very, very difficult situation. You know, don't underestimate how dis dysfunctional and colon colonial the situation is. I mean, two senators in North Dakota sit on Indian Affairs Commission. You know, the tribe has no infrastructure, and they have had their road blockaded for six months, costing them millions of dollars in revenues for their tribal enterprises, as well as the hardship of people just trying to get to town. So, you know, they're in a very, very tough spot. You know. Over the longer term, we're going to need to know how to deconstruct that because they should have justice. Standing Rock should have justice. You know, $3.8 billion would have bought, you know, 123,000 solar panels for houses in North Dakota. It would have put 8, eight kilowatts of solar on 123 houses and 323 2.2 .2 megawatt wind turbines. You know, give me a break. That's what energy independence looks like. So. 
you know, support Standing Rock to survive through this because the river and the people will be there. The river and the people will be there. I personally hope that, you know, Energy Transfer Partners goes bankrupt on this. You know, that's what I, that would be kind of justice to me. I don't know that that's going to happen, but that's what justice looks like in economic terms of white people stuff. You know, you get to go bankrupt or you get to go to jail. You know, but in the meantime, you know, keep an eye on that. Be very supportive of those water protectors, people who choose to stay out there. I have a relative who is on a hunger strike. You know, it's very, 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 you know, I stayed up all half the night last night worrying about this. A lot of our family is worried about it. So if you can be supportive of people on the front lines, do so. If you can be there with the media, do so. Because a lot of things happen in North Dakota when no one is watching. And then also support the veterans to get out there because I honestly believe that the veterans help make a difference. You know, I know what Trump is, is planning to do, but I also know that we need to be there in, in this, you know, when egregious things happen and we need to be present and we, and we need to remember that this is a turning point in our movement, that it is time to say that the rights of corporations should no longer supersede the rights of people and the rights of corporations should no longer supersede the rights of nature because that is what has become in this society where corporations have that much control that you can shoot bullets at people to protect them, you know, and that is wrong, that is wrong. Uh, we have also questions on the other piece of the kind of changing the conversation. There was, we had the questions that were about getting politicians to stop promoting the myth. There's kind of a companion set of questions around um, uh, social media and people who may be, you know, trolling um, the comment sections of major media outlets. There are also questions about whether um, you all are, you know, in, in touch with like Saturday Night Live and The Daily Show and if you feel like those are good places to try to get um, a different message out about pipelines and oil trains and, and fossil fuel dependence. Matt, you want to go? <laughs> uh, sure. For those of you who are on the call who have connections with Saturday Night Live or The Daily Show and, and wish to send them our way, um, by all means do so. Um, I, I do think that the, um, you, know, you know, right now we're watching the, this bizarre assertion from the White House unfold that terrorist attacks are not being covered intentionally to try to minimize terror at the same time that we see the truth, which is that every one of the attacks they mentioned was extensively covered. And the truth is a difficult thing to get to. And the truth that we're hearing from Winona, that we hear from Jane, that we see on the ground in all these different fights, is something that's really hard to get out there. Um, and, I, and I think that as we look at this battle, um, as we look at the idea that you know, I put forward a little bit earlier that we actually are, are we're in an inevitable transition. We are going towards the, the clean energy future that, that Winona was describing, that Jane you know, has a solar barn put up uh, along the KXL route. That's the direction we're going, but it's going to cause a lot of um, turmoil. And that turmoil is both scary for a lot of people and it provides an opportunity to push and to get the truth out there. And so, yeah, it's going to take a, a battle. There, there's going to be misinformation. There's going to be misinformation coming from our White House. There is misinformation from trolls. Some of them are real people and some of them aren't. And I'd say that, you know, when we talk about the ability to succeed, we have to get the truth out there. And we have to make sure that when we uh, come up against racism and misogyny and when we come up against all these different things that intersect, as we fight back against fossil fuel infrastructure, um, we've got to stand up. I, I really appreciated Winona's comment that you know our, our politicians have to have courage. So do we. We have to support them, and, and we have to support them in doing what we want them to do. And it's going to be a, a battle to make sure that this transition is as just as it can possibly be. And we have a, a minimum of four years of fighting as hard as we possibly can against disinformation intentional disinformation coming from our uh, highest level decision makers and leaders in this country. So yeah, if, if, we, uh, if we have the opportunity to talk to those 
media outlets that are that are trusted by many people, if we have ways to do it through social media, that's absolutely an essential part of this this struggle. But it's one that I think we're we're all going to have to participate in. Winona or Jane? You know, I just want to say, can you hear me? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm sorry. The, the coffee shop I'm in is filling up a little bit. Um, the um, you know. I mean, if you look at the big, big picture of things, you know, like every day that guy in D.C. makes somebody else mad. You know what I'm saying? This is like he has succeeded and he is like pissing off everybody. And so, you know, it is it obviously, you know, I always I keep a little bit of perspective on it, you know, and, um, you know, I don't think things will go as jolly as he hopes. And so, you know, the more that we push in every aspect, the media is not very happy with him. The more that we push in all of these aspects, the more lawsuits that emerge against him, you know, the, the, the more that our story also gets out there as a significant part of the social fabric of this. But, you know, I mean, because it is obvious to me that, you know, what I'm looking at is we defeated a pipeline here, you know, and that pipeline was a sandpiper. And those pipes um, are disappearing. I don't know where they're going, though. That's one of the questions I have. I have no idea where the pipes are going. But, um, you know, we are saying that those pipes should go someplace. And, um, you know, they're old pipes. I'm thinking, like, it's not, not that we don't need pipes in the damn country. You know, we need pipes in Flint, Michigan. You know, they need all these pipes. Um, there's places all over this country with the DN infrastructure that need these pipes. And so, you know, there is a there needs to be, like, a conscious discussion about where infrastructure is going in this country, too, from my perspective. Did we lose Anne? I'm still here. I just I couldn't tell. I think, I think, we're, no, I think we're good. I think we're good for the next question. <laughs> yeah, I think Nona muted herself because of the noise. Sorry about that. Um, all right, we're gonna have one last question for everybody, if that's all right. I know Winona has to leave, um, and and I I know that Jane and Matt have <laughs> plenty to do too. Um, so the last question is. Um, a lot of what we're trying to bring forward here is is getting people to look at this as a you know a fight that's about moving off of fossil fuels. It's not about choosing between this way of moving them or that way or moving them through this community or that community. What can we do nationally? What can people on the call do to help support um, national um, national campaigns, linked campaigns between you all and between the many allies that you're working with, what can we do to make this um, as big and unified as it should be? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, when the big days of action are called, so like March 10th is one, um, that's a march in D.C. If you can't make it to D.C., holding a march in your own community, even if it's, you know, marching up and down your block with signs with your kids or your friends, uh, super important that everybody gets out there, post, then post pictures on Twitter and Facebook and definitely tag Trump in that. Um, and then there's another big day of action, April 29th, the People's Climate March. We had the largest historic climate march in New York several years ago, and so they've been having marches kind of every year, so this year's is going to be on uh, April 29th, and those will happen all over the country, including in New York and D.C. is kind of big hubs, and I'm sure L.A. Um, but I also really encourage folks to do two other things that are old-fashioned. One is write a handwritten letter either to President Trump or one of your members of Congress talking about um, why you think it's critical that we start now, not 10 years from now, building clean energy instead of building out um, pipelines and putting more oil on trains. Like, it's really simple, right? We do not need any more, and the more we build, the more we're locked into that stuff for the next 50, 60 to 100 years. And the second old-fashioned thing is hold a bake sale, right? A lot of us have kids that are in soccer games or, you know, if you're a college kid, um, you know, there's always hungry college students on your campus. And so get together, bake some stuff, and hold a bake sale, and send money to Winona's group, Honor of the Earth. Send money to Stand. You know, there are lots of, give money to the small grassroots groups who you know are on the front line, where that $10, $20 donation that you give means a tremendous amount to us. Um, so those are the things that I would suggest. Yeah, I have to agree, uh, Jean. You know, that is really it. I mean, I, I don't want to say, like, go all old-fashioned, but you are right. 
You know, I mean, but Jane and I also live in pretty rural areas, and the more that these people see, you know, that that we are like, you know, that this is the enlightened path. That's really important. And then I also do think that we just need to keep really talking about this dichotomy, and it is this choice. You know, 10, 20 years from now, you're going to have spent a hundred billion dollars on stranded assets, pieces of junk. You know, pieces of junk. And you could spend that $100 billion on doing the right thing. Fix an infrastructure that's leaking, busting up across the country, putting people to work. You know, up here the battle we're dealing with on line three, they want to abandon first line three. They basically want to abandon five pipelines and make a whole new line, you know, a whole new corridor in, in through pristine territory. You don't get to leave an old mess for us. And this is a, a national infrastructure crisis because you've got aging pipelines across this country that these companies are going to try to start abandoning and leaving all of the liability to landowners and you know and and the real estate market health industry everybody is affected by this liability being transferred from corporations to landowners because there's no clear you know responsibility for it once once those pipelines are abandoned and so we need to be very, very vigilant and not let that happen. That large transition of, of abandoned infrastructure and, and you know leave, leaving us holding that bag and then creating a whole new mess 50 years from now. So let us be you know prudent because that is not a Republican or Democrat issue. You know I don't know why you know, I, I, they baffle me. Their stupidity just baffles me. But you know anybody who is prudent knows that you don't get to like leave this mess. And um, you know that is not it is not frugal and it is it is not prudent. So you know stick to some of them issues and 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 push for this this enlightened transition. And and I do appreciate the support. You know I have to say our organization got a lot of supporters. You know this last while we are really on the ground, and I really appreciate that. You know I I got bake sales. I got I got bake sale money. You know I got rummage sale money. I got you know kids putting together <laughs> things. I got you know I got I got tattoo artists sending me money. You know, how cool is that? Tattoo artists. There's a standing rock tattoo. You guys will look at this tattoo. You know, it's like cool stuff. This is an opportunity for us to work together, you know, and to be cool. Because the other thing is, is like, get real. We are so much cooler than they will ever be. You know, we are more interesting. We're more vibrant. We are be have better music. We got better moves. We got better art. You know, celebrate the beauty of who we are. And, and continue to marginalize their ugliness, you know, because that's what they are. It's an ugly thing. And then I, I cannot say it enough times, you know, you want your heroin delivered by train or you want your heroin delivered by pipeline. That's the choice they're giving you. And the fact is, is that you don't even want the heroin. You know, that's what we got to start saying. We got to start saying it's not a choice between the two. You just don't want the heroin. I guess I'll, I'll add on one more thing, and I'm, I'm a little bit jealous of the tattoo artists uh, as donors, but uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I echo everything that both Jane and Winona just said, but, but I would also add that um, all the resistance, so much of it uh, is local. Wherever we are up and down a pipeline route, wherever we are on rail routes or in rail terminal communities, we, we have a local fight on our hands. Um, we, can, we can push back. One of the strongest tools we have are local land use laws and sometimes treaties. Um, but we also get to do the local solution sets. And I live in a rainy place. I live in northwest Washington. Um, and we wanted to go off, not exactly off grid, but we wanted to produce more power. And we were able to go to a local solar uh, panel manufacturer that has now gone from a dozen employees to 200 employees or more. We were able to get uh, the transformers from another Washington organization. We were able to work with a loan package in the state of Washington, and now we produce more power than we use. And this is this is not uh, the, the technology of the future. This is the technology of today. And the idea, uh, in particular, that Winona put out there, that we're going to lock ourselves into 10 or 15 years of dirty, increasingly dirty infrastructure that's then abandoned, because um, we know we're going this direction, is silly. And so uh, the, the model that we see in Portland, Oregon, of both affirming clean energy solutions and legislating out new fossil fuel infrastructure, the model that we're seeing in Whatcom County, where I live, um, it's real because we, we have one of the biggest concentrations of threats of these fossil fuel infrastructure proposals, and we have the opportunity to put in clean energy and that dichotomy. 
people look at it and they say, what, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> this makes no sense at all. Um, and, and so I think that every place in this country where you can reach out to your local elected leaders, where you can work with your local organizations or, or, or whomever else you have there to really affirm these solutions, to push them forward, to demonstrate it so people see it happening everywhere, that to me is going to be part of the, uh, the moral authority that we hold up and we say, no more fossil fuel infrastructure. This is silly. It's time to start ratcheting back the dirty stuff and affirming the clean stuff. The more we can do that on the ground locally, the faster we win. Because we're going to win. The question is how fast. Yeah, I just want to say one more thing on that, too, because I totally agree. Like, my community, um, you know, my village of Pine Point, totally written off, bottom of the barrel, nothing ever trickled down. You know, we, we're putting solar panels on houses in a, in a housing project, solar thermal, we're putting solar on the school, and we're the poorest damn people in the state of Minnesota. You know what I'm saying? If we can do that, it, the more that you illustrate the example, and the fact is, is that the tide is changing. I mean, I really like that victory in Florida where the oil companies pump and the utilities pumped all that money into stopping the solar being able to put on your houses, and the people voted it down. You know, that's what the future is. And so the more examples we give, the more people who are fearful and afraid sitting on the side see the enlightened path. So let us be that enlightened path, but also let us have courage in the face of, of stupidity and, and in the face of that which comes you know, from, from Washington. Thank you, though. All right, everybody. Thank you so much to our presenters. Thank you, Winona, Jane, and Matt. Thank you so much. Thanks to our audience today. There were a lot of great questions that we couldn't get to. And um, I'm going to try to share them with the presenters. And uh, and I know everybody's busy, but I'll share them. And there's also just lots of great uh, uh, info sharing that's happened through the questions. So if you, if you sent in links, I will include them when I send the link to the recording of the webinar. Thanks for thinking about that, that that's another way to support um, everybody who's involved in this. And I um, uh, just want to ask if there's any last, any presenter want to say any last thing before we close out for the day? Thank you. I just want to thank my pals there. You guys are great. Jane, I think you're awesome. Come visit us. Come visit us. I will. I will. Thank you all so much. You too, Matt. Thanks, guys. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.